Welcome to Making Money. This is Matt McCall. Thanks for joining me. It's Tuesday, February 28th, 2023. I have a special interview coming up for you. One of the legends in the natural resources space, Rick Rule, is joining me. We're going to talk about everything from oil and gas to gold. And maybe he's actually changed my view. Then we dive into graphite, the one natural resource he is super bullish on the next several years. But before that, I'm going to tell you something that's very special that's coming up next week that Rick Rule will be doing. For the first time ever, Rick is partnering with Stansbury Research for a brand new project. It's unlike anything we've done in the past. And once you see what he's up to, I think he'll also be a pivotal moment for you as well. This Thursday, Rick joins Dan Ferris of Stansbury Research to talk about a critical turning point in the stock market, the likes of which he's not seen in 50 years of natural resource investing. And if you know how to play this opportunity, he believes you may never have to worry about money again. To hear Rick's big prediction and to get more details on his new project, head to rickrulesr.com to sign up. Again, that's rickrulesr. If you want to know all about the once in a lifetime financial event, Rick says is unfolding right now. Until then, here's Rick Rule right now on Making Money. So without further ado, here's Rick Rule. Rick, thanks so much for coming on the show. I mean, I've been trying to get you on for a while because when it comes to natural resources, there's nobody else out there I want to talk to. And what I like about you is you cover everything from gold to uranium to fossil fuels. You know, usually somebody just sticks to one, but man, oh man, the knowledge that you have over the years, uh, I, I, want to, I really appreciate you jumping in and joining us here on the show. Before we jump into natural resources, because I'm going to pick your brain like you wouldn't believe right now, because... I'm actually turning pretty damn bullish on some of these natural resources right now, which might be too late, but we'll talk about that later. Before we jump into that, Rick, I kind of want to get your view and I ask any guest this. You know, we had a wild 2022 where, you know, oil obviously had a heck of a year, but not many other asset classes did very well. Starting off 2023 so far, market's looking good, but granted, six weeks time frame. Why don't you give us your big picture view of kind of how you're viewing just the world right now going forward? From a general point of view, I'm playing defense, Matt. Uh, I've been in the investing business for 49 years now. Uh, playing defense to me means sticking to what I know, which is to say <clears throat> I'm not entertaining any any investments outside natural resources or conventional financial services because I know those businesses. I have no fear of missing out. <laughs> I have a fear of getting clobbered. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm maintaining fairly high cash balances, which comes at a cost. Uh, you know, um, High yield savings accounts are yielding sort of three and a half, four percent in a currency that the Congressional Budget Office acknowledges is losing seven percent compounded, which means the net effect of my cash holding so that I'm losing three percent of my purchasing power a year. I consider that purchasing power loss to be an option premium. Uh, I have found if, if we experience real market downturns, I'm not saying that we're going to, but if we had a recession, or if we had a black swan event, uh, having the cash would give me the tools and I hope the courage to take advantage of the situation rather than being taken advantage of by uh, the situation. I'm also playing the game around net present value, not potential, uh, which is to say I'm not buying plays that will be worth extraordinarily more in high commodity prices, but rather paying attention to companies that are selling a, at a discount to their net present value at current commodity prices. Um, that's interesting because I feel like, Rick, I'm mean, not to cut you off, but that's interesting because most people I bring on, they talk about where prices will be and, <laughs> and they tend to ignore, you know, net present value NPV. I remember, I it thinks me of grad school and finance classes. I, I think of you like net present value, it's like they drill, they drill that into our head. So that's a very unique way of looking at it. And I assume that lowers your risk a bit by not pricing in much higher commodity prices. Yeah, Matt, I'm going to assume that most of the guests that you have on are younger than me. <laughs> uh, I'm, <laughs> I'm not saying anything. <laughs> I, I'm 70 years of age. Uh, and what happens is, particularly if you're a little concerned about the market, you come to the point in time where you recognize that giving away part of your upside in change for reducing greatly your downside is not a bad trade. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> not a bad trade, particularly when the opportunities available in areas I know well, conventional banking, oil and gas, stuff like that, where 
the opportunities exist to buy high quality disc assets at discounts to that present value, uh, perhaps because of the prevailing political ethos in the United States. I don't know why. But the idea that I need to stretch and take a real risk when good valuations are available without taking too much risk, <laughs> that sort of gears my tech, you know, my strategies. Yeah. And, and really, that's I don't care how what your risk tolerance is. That's one hell of a plan. It doesn't matter. I mean, you're just setting up and, and again, in an area that, you know, so one area, uh, obviously, within natural resources that a heck of a year last year was uh, oil and gas. And even though oils pull back, a lot of the energy stocks are still trading near highs. They pull back a little bit. But do you see opportunity in, in the fossil fuel space right now? I still see a lot of value in fossil fuels. Uh, I think it's become, pardon me, it's because the political class is doing their very best to decapitalize the oil and gas business. While Mr. Biden is suggesting to oil companies that they should produce more, He's telling them he's going to put them out of business in 2030. <laughs> uh, that's not a really good way to bring a lot of capital into the business. It is estimated by the International Energy Agency that the oil and gas business worldwide is deferring about a billion dollars a day in sustaining capital investments, which means that they are underinvesting $360 billion a year which means wow. that their ability to produce is going to decline. Paradoxically, what Mr. Biden is doing is making sure that we have to pay high prices for oil uh, and maintain very good margins for oil producers for a long time. The trick is to find oil and gas companies that generate reasonable earnings while still investing in the sustaining capital investments necessary to maintain their production. Uh, and those companies still exist. The big thinkers would have you believe, Matt. When I say the big thinkers, I'm being sarcastic. That noted energy phys physicist Greta Thornburg, uh, our president, <laughs> as an example, has suggested that uh, peak oil demand will occur in about 2030. My suspicion is that will occur in 2045 or 2050 and then tail off from that. So when I do a net present value calculation, I don't write it down to zero at 2030 because the oil and business will be alive and robust. Let me give you uh, a statistic that I think will support this. Goldman Sachs suggests that the world has now invested $4.6 trillion in alternative energies in the last 40 years, and they've reduced the market share of fossil fuels from 82% to 81% after an investment of $4.6 trillion. How much capital might it take to reduce oil's market share substantially from here? And where might that money come from? We've seen some of the alternatives. The Germans decided in their wisdom to phase out power that worked, uh, which is to say nuclear, uh, in favor of solar in the far north where the sun doesn't shine. The consequence of that is that their power prices are up by 500% and they still suffer blackouts. The dichotomy between the political positions of the big thinkers and the needs and wants of ordinary human beings around the world suggests to me, Matt, that the oil and gas business is a good place to be, particularly perhaps now in the United States where markets have worked and the price of natural gas has fallen by 60%. That's caused the prices of the best natural gas producers in this hemisphere, in this continent, to sell off fairly substantially, despite the fact that major investments are being made in natural gas transmission and in the fabrication and construction of nat uh, natural gas liquids plants to export this, uh, this product uh, to Europe. So I, I, I'm I mean, still attracted wow. to the oil and gas business. Now, listen, yeah. three years ago, we had an extraordinary circumstance where the political winds were blowing against oil and gas, but then COVID came and knocked out demand too. The oil prices, you'll recall, fair, fell to sub-zero. Um, I remember saying uh, at the time, uh, ironically in a Stansbury interview, that one's... Uh, investment outlook around oil could be determined by one question. And that was three or four years hence, when the listener went out to the garage and turned the key to the right, would their car start or not? Because at $20 in oil, 
the twenty dollars a barrel oil, there wasn't going to be supply of oil in five years. It needed to go above sixty. So the choice at the time was: if you believed that your car wouldn't start in five years, you shouldn't own oil stocks. If you did believe that your car would start uh, in five years, you had to buy oil stocks because the oil price had to go from twenty dollars a barrel to sixty dollars a barrel. Of course, it didn't. It went to a hundred before re re returning down to seventy. Suffice it to say, Matt, markets work. Oil is an extremely efficient uh, fuel, uh, particularly for vehicle transport, and it will be with us for a long time. You know, I, I can't agree with you more, and I love how you break it down, Rick, and make it so simple. I mean, you can, you can, get, you can really walk you with this. I know you're extremely intelligent, but the fact that you, that question that you asked three or so years ago during the pandemic, will your car start? I mean, that's just a, just a logical way to look at investing in the world, honestly. And I don't know, I'll tell you, you know, my background is is on innovation. So I invest in a little bit riskier, you know, things, right. everything from uh, autonomous vehicles down the road to chips, you name it. But what I'm finding, Rick, and we've been doing a lot of research, my team and I on this uh, as of late and building kind of our, our, our future of energy barbell investment. Half of it is what I call dirty energy, everything we just talked about. Right. The other half is I do believe solar will continue to grow. However, a lot of our clean energy investments aren't to pure solar you think of. It's some of these natural resources that are in huge need to build this out. Oil and gas being one of them. You, you can't build all this steel and everything needed for these wind, you know, these wind turbines and solar without it. It's impossible. So to me, I think there's a, a great natural resources play tied to clean energy. And I'd like to get your view on that. Well, certainly uh, the future that we envision, which is to say more demand for all forms of energy mm -hmm. will necessitate enormous inputs of natural resources. Uh, every part of the value chain that isn't intellectual capital is physical capital. It's either grown or mined. Those are your two choices. As a society, we've been under investing in productive capacity and mining for 30 years, just at the point in time where both demographics and technology point to increased consumption of minerals. You mentioned electricity. The most important electricity metal is copper. Copper gets stuff from the generator to the house, and then it distributes stuff through the house and through the car. Through the car. And your focus on technology around the efficient use of energy is a wonderful thing. I do simpler things, but let's <laughs> let's return to the subject at hand. I'm sort of an icon for the copper business in the sense that I'm 70 years of age. The median big copper mine in the world is beginning to look like me, which is to say aged and long of tooth. Bingham Canyon, the biggest copper mine in the United States, 160 years old. Chuki Kamada, 120 years old. Erzberg, 60 years old. Uh, Escondida, 45 years old. You don't stand at the top of a pit, throw in water and fertilizer and have the thing grow more copper. That's not the way it works. Uh, but we haven't invested uh, on a global basis in exploration, in construction, in development in the copper business for a very, very, very long time. The energy future that you describe is resource intensive. And it isn't all, although importantly, it is technology. There are about a billion people on earth that have no access to electricity at all. There's another 2 billion people on earth, the poorest of the poor, that have access to either unaffordable uh, or intermittent electricity. Are we going to need more solar? You betcha. Wind? Yep, that too. Coal? Be with us for a very long time. Oil and gas, nuclear, all of the above. Not just for technology, but because we need to continue to do a good job advancing the material lives of the poorest of the poor. Those people want to live like you and I live, and we live a very energy-dense life, and we want to live better. So do you see any of the commodity kind of uh, forward countries uh, really kind of outperforming going forward due to that? Yeah, I, I need to say that 50 years investing in natural resources uh, has made me sort of a connoisseur of political risk. Uh, and I've experienced some of it too. You know, I was a fairly good sized investor in Russia, which treated me well for 20 years and then treated me very poorly all of a sudden. <laughs> yeah. But I will say that there are a few countries in the world that are really managing uh, their economic emergence. Uh, as a consequence of resource as well. Chile did it, although Chile is now with a socialist government trying to snatch defeat from the jaws of victory. 
uh, this next country may be too small to play. Uh, Guyana, uh, with less than a million people, now has 7 billion recoverable barrels of oil. Wow. The, the state taken that will be over 50%, approaching 60%. Uh, if you assume uh, a, a, a $20 margin uh, over 20 years on 7 billion barrels of oil, you understand something about the social rents that will flow to a small company like country like Guyana. Um, politicians seem to have a facility for wasting vast amounts of money. But that one seems... That opportunity seems almost, probably not a word, unblowable. Uh, mm -hmm. I I think it'll probably have a, a, a happy a happy outcome for them. Uh, what about the continent of Africa? I, not to shift shift away from Central America, South America, there, but like, what I mean, Africa seems to be overlooked. And obviously, it's you know they have what twenty of the fastest uh, or fifteen of the twenty fastest growing cities in the world, something like that. I mean, the growth is amazing. So there's any demand for energy. How do you view Africa? You make a great point. Uh, you know, when people, the narrative around Africa is, of course, war, AIDS, Ebola, poverty. Uh, but the African middle class is the most rapidly growing middle class in the world. Yeah. Uh, African economies, many African economies are growing at six or seven percent compounded. I spend a lot of time in Africa uh, because I'm involved in extractive businesses. And what I like to point out to Western investors, particularly Caucasian investors, let's just be honest about it is the incredible inventory of human resources in Africa, the incredible technologists, the incredible uh, entrepreneurs, all the way down to the market ladies, who I wish were running those countries, <laughs> uh, to the <laughs> geologists, to the engineers. Africa is going to be a very, very, very bumpy road because Africa has too much government activity relative to economic activity. And the route to success and power has seldom been to satisfy consumer wants in Africa, but rather to seize control of the reins of power in Africa. So you'll continue to have those political dislocations. But if you're a resource investor, you have to go where the big deposits are. That's in Africa. You have to go to places where the competition is afraid to enter. That's Africa. <laughs> so uh, I'm very attracted to Africa. I, I mean, I need to say in terms of cash in, cash out, the best country in my memory has been Chile, but the second best country in my memory has been Congo. That isn't to say that I haven't taken substantial risks. I risked, I invested there in 95 and 96 in the midst of a civil war that killed 2 million people. Uh, but in the end, the rewards much more than justified the risks. Do you see any specific uh, natural resources that, that really could really capture as an investor for the future of uh, battery technology? Yeah, it's a fairly small space, uh, but I'm really attracted to the technology around vanadium. Uh, okay. And the investment case for vanadium has usually been made in the context of vanadium alloys that generate high technology uses for steel, uh, things like jet engines, jet skins, and stuff like that. But I think the vanadium redox battery uh, and other utility scale batteries in the future, efficient batteries that can actually store uh, with reasonable charge and discharge times, uh, I think the potential demand that we'll see for vanadium on top of the existing demand means that if I had to look at a subspace uh, a less well-known subspace in the battery space, it would be vanadium. Uh, you know, the superstar right now is lithium because it's up 400% in five years. The fact that it's up 400% makes it so much less attractive to me. The price of lithium doesn't need to go up. Everybody and their brother is scrambling to find lithium. Meanwhile, there isn't a shortage of lithium. There's a shortage of lithium processing capacity. Uh, you need to get the material into a, into a chemical state where it can be used in a battery. And my belief is that we're five years away from having more than sufficient uh, processing capacity in lithium. What happens, Matt, I think, is that people who come to understand a narrative see the narrative being justified by an increase in price, uh, not understanding that that increase in price has obviated most of the benefit of understanding the narrative. The fact that lithium is up by 400% in five years means that the, the lithium narrative was true, but the value has already been taken out of it by the price increase.
Yep. Yeah, I, I agree with that. That's a, that's a great way to look at it because lithium, again, it's the hot kind of natural resource when you think about uh, batteries right now, electric cars. You know, I, I saw something, and, and I just saw this last week, Rick, and I just want to get your thoughts on it. I, I, I can't believe I remember who did it. I'm looking at it now. It's a chart. It's from the IEA, and it shows the mineral content of a conventional car versus an EV. Right. And obviously, uh, manganese doubles, copper goes up about 2.5x. Um, but there was there was a natural resource that caught my eye, and it actually has the the largest amount of kilograms needed according to this sixty six point three kilograms, and that's graphite. The increasing use of graphite in all kinds of applications has me interested. Uh, un unfortunately, there are so many different grades of graphite, uh, so many different properties of graphite that it isn't enough to have a view on the graphite market. You have to have enough of a knowledge of large flake and small flake graphite as an example, the supply of each and the demand for each. Um, I'm doing a fairly deep dive on graphite now. And what I've managed to accomplish is quantify how little I know. <laughs> <laughs> I love the honesty. And, and quantify more importantly, uh, you know, I've begun to interview some of these experts in the graphite market. And I've learned that most of the experts are expert by way of reputation rather than by way of reality. So I'm just now beginning to learn who the experts are and who the experts aren't. Perhaps someday in the future, when I feel uh, more comfortable, uh, I'll come on your show and talk about graphite, but I'm not comfortable yet. I'm one of those experts that isn't. No, no, I, I appreciate that. And when you become an expert, which I have no doubt you will, Rick, I'm getting you back on here because I still think it's a fascinating uh, investment looking out you know, down the road. I, I mean, I agree with you. The uh, graphite isn't hard to find, but the right graphite is very hard to find. Uh, and yeah. learning what that right kind is, is something I'm devoting myself to now. All right, good. You're doing the work for me. I appreciate that. Man, this is making my life I'm easier. Um, so the metal we have to talk about, which I get grief every day of my life about um and and that that's gold and i get grief about it because i own an investment firm rick for 17 years i sold at stansbury asset management about a year and a half ago and gold was my largest holding from like 06 to 2010 and i had all different types of portfolios but we just owned gld and had a hell of a run you know we had more than doubled our money but since then, I haven't been a big fan of it. So people think that I'm, you know, this anti-gold guy. So the gold bugs, like, despise me. And I always say, if it comes back to a level that I find attractive, and I think there's a right, uh, a, a correct investment thesis for it, I will move into it. I just don't see it now. What say you when it comes to gold looking at right now? Uh, two things. Uh, for me, particularly at my age, uh, with my wealth, gold is an insurance asset. Uh, I'm in the odd position of owning a fair bit of gold and hoping the price doesn't go up because the set of circumstances that will cause the gold price to go up will interfere with my lifestyle. And my lifestyle is very good. Thank you. <laughs> so uh, own gold. Uh, if you believe that there is some possibility that things get worse from here, uh, invest in gold, which is different than owning it for investment purposes in a different sense. Gold does well. When people are nervous uh, uh, about the purchasing power of other savings and investment products, the real case for gold goes like this. Uh, it's the anti-10-year treasury. So let's look at the investment arithmetic around the 10-year treasury. Yields what? 350 basis points, 360 basis points? Mm -hmm. In a currency that the Congressional Budget Office suggests is experiencing purchasing power depreciation of 7.5% a year, which is to say the U.S. government absolutely positively guarantees you, if you lend them money for 10 years, that they will erode your purchasing power by 4% a year, compounded for 10 years. My friend Jim Grant calls that return-free risk. So gold really is competing with return-free risk. What's the circumstance What's the probability that the circumstance changes or doesn't change going forward? Well, one would be debt and deficits. Uh, I'm just going to talk about United States now. We have $32 trillion. That, by the way, is 12 digits to the left of the, de left of the decimal points uh, in federal on-balance sheet liabilities. 
26, I guess, net of the treasuries, net of counterfeiting, net of the treasury's balance sheet. But we have off balance sheet liabilities. Your viewers should look at me, age 70, Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, that by the, F, by the estimate of the Congressional Budget Office exceed $100 trillion. So at the federal level, not state and local, not underfunded pension plans, we have $130 trillion net present value of liabilities, which we service with a budget that's $2 trillion a year in deficit at last year's interest rates. What do you think the probability is that the government can let, if they can control it, the interest rate go positive in, mm -hmm. you know, in a, in a sort of a 40 year mean where you, where we had negative or pardon me, positive real interest rates. If the inflation rate seven and a half percent, that would suggest a headline rate on the U.S. 10 year uh, of at least 100 basis points positive, which is to say eight and a half percent. That would suggest a 10 and a half percent first mortgage yield, <laughs> uh, nine and three quarters prime. What do you think the probabilities are that that occurs? I would suggest to you nil. What do you think the probabilities of a balanced budget are? I would suggest to you nil. Mm -hmm. The um, market share of gold and precious metals, particularly relative to the fundamentals, is ridiculously low. Less than one half of 1% of the savings and investment assets in the United States are in precious metals or precious metals related assets. The 40 year mean is 2%. The estimated high in 1981 was six and a half percent. I'm not suggesting to you, Matt, that gold will win the war against the US dollar or even win the war against the US treasury. I'm suggesting that they'll lose the war less badly. As concerns mount, uh, with regards to marginally higher interest rates on long bond prices, as investors come to understand that the uh, long bond yield is negative, sharply negative, and as they become concerned about debt and deficits, what I'm telling you is that I believe that the market share of precious metals will revert to mean, revert to its 40-year mean. If that happens, demand for precious metals and precious metals related securities will quadruple in the largest savings and investment market in the world. And that's precisely what I think is going to happen. I'm not one of these guys who says that we're going to go to a gold backed currency or, yeah. you know, all that kind of stuff. That isn't what I think is going to happen. I think we're going to have a reversion to mean. I actually think we're going to have an overshoot, but a fairly modest overshoot compared to most people who are bullish gold. And a reversion to mean generates a fourfold increase in demand, which is what I think is going to happen. That's the best argument I've ever heard. And I'm being 100% honest with you, Rick. It's the best argument I've ever heard to own gold. The only thing I'm going to play, I have to play devil's advocate because I'm sitting on your side here. Love it. That to, to get that Forex, get back to 2%, I'm not saying it won't happen. We have a lot of uh, generational wealth being shifted to younger people. And, yep. you know, I'm 46. I, I'm not a gold guy. I'm kind of in the middle here. But, you know, a lot of people I know, late 30s, early 40s, starting to get money passed down from parents and grandparents, and they don't want to own gold. Not, not that I'm not saying they're running into Bitcoin, but they don't want to own gold. They want to experience, and they're scared of the stock market, too. So I, I, none of it makes sense to me. They're scared of investing. So if, if that mindset of that shift of, of all this great wealth in the next 10 years or so to a younger generation, obviously it's going to take a long time. But will that hold it back from that? Because they just don't view gold the same way last generation did. You know, Matt, it's hard to believe looking at me, but I was a young person once. <laughs> uh, and when I came as an agent, as an investor, gold hadn't performed as an asset until it was price, since it was price controlled by Roosevelt, mm -hmm. which is to say there was a period of time of 40 years in U.S. history where gold didn't perform at all. Was I schooled as a young person to believe in gold? Absolutely not. Mercifully, I didn't learn about gold too late. When the set of circumstances came about that moved gold, gold forced itself into my consciousness. I didn't go looking for it. There was a set of circumstances in the 70s, eerily similar to the set of circumstances today that caused me to be interested in gold. But I, uh, the gold case isn't really about you and me, Matt, I think. I think that the gold case is about the largest institutional investors in the world. Let's think for a second that Matt McCall doesn't work for Stansberry. 
but rather he runs the Stanford University Endowment. Uh, and his investment decisions will be responsible for the good operation of that university 20 years from now or 25 years from now. And so Matt needs to think about uh, investments today that are efficacious in terms of compounding returns for the benefit of the institution 20 or 25 years from now. For the last 40 years, benign economic climate, more globalization, greater inclusion in the workforce, but particularly declining real interest rates. The Stanford Endowment ha has been sort of 60% uh, equities, 40% debt. Uh, let's look at that 40% now. Let's look at the economics around that 40%. Two things are happening. The interest rates are rising, which means that the capitalized value of distributions, which is to say the market price of the bond, is decreasing, not increasing. So the corpus of the endowment, the pension fund, is falling, but the institution doesn't have more money to add to it. But a much more complex challenge for Matt McCall portfolio manager, is that owning the long bonds, which have performed so well for him for the last 40 years on a riskless basis, are all of a sudden costing the endowment 3.5% or 4% of purchasing power compounded, which means that the funding assumptions that he and the chancellors make for the operations of the university 10 years from now, 15 years from now, 20 years from now, 25 years from now, are challenged by the very asset class that has been partially partially responsible for his success in the last 40 years. Matt's habit as a portfolio manager have been governed by what made what made sense for him in the past. But Matt, given that he has ascended to ascended in the ranks of portfolio managers to the extent that he can manage the Stanford endowment is forward thinking enough to understand that the arithmetic around the long bond is flawed. Will Matt sell all his long bonds? And will that disintermediation all pour into gold? No. But his holdings of gold might increase from zero to one or zero to two. Mm -hmm. That's my argument. Oh, it's I, love, not, I like it. It's yeah. not about the baby, the baby boomers who are, yeah. you know, going to leave, uh, the assets that they've been lucky enough to accumulate in the last 40 years to younger people who sadly can't spell gold. Uh, <laughs> all that will happen, though that will happen too. What will happen is that the largest pension plans in the world, the largest endowments in the world, the largest sovereign wealth funds in the world, will see that in a period of negative real interest rates, but rising nominal interest rates, that what Franz Pick said is true. Long bonds are certificates of guaranteed confiscation. I love that. I, I, I mean, I, I, I can talk to you for probably the next two weeks and, and take notes about this stack that's high, Rick. I, this, is, this is amazing. Um, because, you know, again, I, I'm just, I, I'm not investing in gold right now. And I'll tell you why I'm not. Because my forte is finding innovation. And, and, and you know, that's what I've been good at for 20 years, 20 yep. plus years doing this. So I stick to what I know. Yep. And, that, and that's, that's the pure reason. And I want people to know that I watch, you know, a lot of people watch are, are all ages, you know, that Rick makes a great point here. I'm not telling you you shouldn't own gold. You know, I, I don't tell you to do anything, make your own decisions, but I just don't own personally. That's just me. But but you make a great point. And, and I think for a lot of people and 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 I got to tell you, I have nine years left in my contract at Stansbury. But I, but if you can get me in at Stanford, I might have to get over there and take that job. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it's funny. I'm I'm on the other side of the discussion. I was born in San Jose, California, in Silicon Valley, uh, and grew up watching the big industry there go from food machinery to semiconductors and stuff like that. And for many years, uh, I invested a fairly small amount of money in technology, not because I understood it, but because specifically because I didn't understand it. But I knew some people who did understand it, uh, and it treated me well. Uh, I will say that from my point of view, technology treated me too well. And I've absented myself from technology investments, not because I don't think technology will work, uh, but because rather uh, the people who invested my money for me, uh, first of all, <laughs> are in their declining years. Uh, but secondly, they made so much money that they're not interested in managing mine. Yeah. Uh, I, like you, stick to what I know. 
And so if you bring me an opportunity now that's outside of conventional financial services uh, or natural resources, I won't do it. So I really applaud your sticking to what you know. Although I would suggest that if you own house insurance uh, and life insurance and auto insurance, that you consider some form of political insurance too. And the best form of political insurance that I've seen through the millennia has been gold. Mm -hmm. No, I, I, you know, I, I, I appreciate that. And I, and I believe in that. I, there's part of me though, like I still had that 32 year old mentality in me where it's like, I don't need that insurance. I'm fine. You know, I'm, I'm that may be. To to my doctor, I, yeah, I got to my you. doctor for my annual visit in a couple of days. I'll let you know how it goes. But uh, yeah, like it's, it's, it's just that, that mindset. Yep. But Rick, before I, before I let you go, I, I ask every guest this question and uh, I usually call it the island question. Um, if I were to put you, your family, friends, whoever you want on an island for 10 years, you live there, can't check the internet, nothing. You can have one investment. It could be an asset class. It could be the market. It could be anything, anything in the world. What is the one investment for the next 10 years? I'm sure using your NPV, net present value, uh, that looks very attractive to you. Oh, your audience is going to hate me. <laughs> uh, I mean, it's not as hate as it was, but uh, coal. Coal? Yeah. Uh, despite the forecasts of that netted, noted energy physicist Greta Thornburg, uh, <laughs> the biggest year in coal demand in recorded history was 2022, about to be eclipsed by 2023. Uh, coal assets are trading hands at one and a half times free cash flow, where they're sitting on 20 and 30 year reserves. I know that none of your listeners will take me up on that, by the way. <laughs> you don't think um, so? I, I, I tell you, my listeners, though, they, they, they definitely think outside the box. So I, they're, they're what, not a one-sided. What I would ask everyone to do, rather than pick a topic, which is what you asked me to do, is that your listeners consider investing in themselves, uh, in their knowledge, in their ability to assimilate information. Uh, what I found is that knowledge and education – is an asset that can't be stolen from you. <laughs> In my case, perhaps a little of it was lost. Uh, <laughs> but the truth is, it, it isn't taxed except for the benefit from it. Uh, and what I would urge people to do, rather than try to find um, the best subject that they possibly could, is to invest in improving themselves as a student. Uh, what I've learned over time is that as my investment processes uh, got better. My investment results got better, almost irrespective of market conditions. Yeah, I, I will tell you what I've learned in the last few years. I, I thought I knew everything right in your 30s. I didn't need to, to, to read as much. I read so much now and I realize how little I actually know, Rick. It, it's amazing. It, it, it's, I feel like the more I read, the less educated I feel because you just realize how big the world is and how many smart people there are out there. And, and you know, having people like you come on the show makes me smart. You know, I love the amount of notes that I have in my head right now just from the last 35 minutes of speaking with you. Yeah, you're reciting my graphite experience. I mean, I understand how to study a commodity. I've done it for 50 years. And God, I don't know how many hours I am into this. And I'm in the introduction still. I'm not even in chapter one. <laughs> I love it. I love that. I don't care what age you are. Continue to educate yourself. I also think it makes you stay young. Keeps that brain working. I mean, I, I, I think that's so important. Uh, well, but Rick, we, we, we want to have you back on soon. I know you have. Right. We're going to talk about it in a minute. But you have a big, big promotion. We're coming up here with Stansbury. So I'm glad to have you be, you know, part of the team, whatever you want to call it, you know, connected with us. I've been a fan of yours for a very, very long time now. Um, so I look forward to sitting down with you one day and, and talking more, too. And, and then when you have your graphite done, Man, oh man, I'm gonna. I may come out and sit with you and talk about it. We'll film it out there. Well, I I look forward to sharing the information and the misinformation that I uh, managed to gather. It's an absolutely fascinating topic. It it may be that as an investment class, the companies in it are too small, and mm -hmm. so it may be that I spend hundreds of hours uh, assimilating some kind of useless information. I'll find that out as I go. Uh, but the process. <laughs> The process is a lot of fun, uh, and I always learn things that are applicable and meet people who are useful in other circumstances, even when I acquire knowledge that ends up <laughs> being valueless. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, it's it's like it's kind of like that knowledge I could use on Jeopardy when I get on there one day. If there's ever a question <laughs> about Graphite, right? <laughs> hey, Rick, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, look forward to sitting down with person soon and getting you back on the show. But again, thank you so much for your time and uh, good luck with everything you're doing here at Stansberry. And uh, we'll have you back on soon. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Opinions expressed on this program are solely those of the contributor and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Stansbury Research, its parent company, or affiliates.